I think you're muted if you're trying to talk. I'll go ahead and, and introduce myself. I'm Tracy. Oh, you got it? I'm back. I'm okay. sorry about that. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Global Math Department. My name is Jill Bemis, and I muted myself, so I apologize for that. I'll be your host tonight. Tonight, we're going to hear from Tracy Jackson on HALT, halt 8 Thinking Thieves. And please, would everybody introduce yourselves in the chat? Tell us where you're at, what you're teaching. If you want to put your Twitter handle, Twitter handle in there, I'm going to give everybody just a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll get started. So please introduce yourself. And then as you're doing that, there's also some resources at the top. So they should be pinned to the top of the chat if you want to go ahead and click on that. We got people from everywhere. Love that. All right, while you're finishing introducing yourselves, I'd like to explain how these meetings work. These meetings are recorded and are available within 24 hours after the meeting ends. To view the recording, you can use the same link that you used to get here tonight. The global math community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. I will do my best to grab your questions during the presentation so that Tracy can address them at the end of the presentation. Tonight, we are fortunate to share the evening with Tracy Jackson. Tracy is currently a secondary math teacher on special assignment. She has a passion for all things math education. She delights in studying research-based practices to bring mathematical thinking, joy, and learning to as many people as possible. Tracy's a math education doctoral candidate, longtime teacher, recipient of the 2016 Rosenthal Prize for Math Teaching Innovation, and proud PCMI participant. On her journey, she tries to always be curious, learning, and growing. Um, I'm going to turn it off over to you, Tracy, and I will be here listening. So just holler if there's anything I can do to help you. Welcome, right. Tracy. Thank you so much. I'm really <laughs> honored to be here. Well, so long time listener, um, first time presenter. And so at today's session goal, we're going to examine eight ways we unintentionally limit student thinking and then what we can do instead. So you can find the resources either by typing in the bit.ly link or you can just click at the top of the chat. So we're going to be using some of those resources today. So we're going to be looking at eight different ways. Now, um, truth be told, I have done all of these things before. So these the reason I have these practices that I know are eight thinking thieves is because I personally have gone through this journey and I'm going to share it a little bit with you. The first one we're going to talk about is memorizing and mimicking. And we're going to start back with my own teaching journey. I started teaching in the Bay Area. Uh, this was before phones and GPS, and I didn't really know how to get places. And so um, they had this wonderful invention during my first couple of years teaching called MapQuest. And you would just type in the address to where you wanted to go. Um, and it would give you step-by-step -step directions. Like you could follow your odometer and it would tell you exactly when to turn left and exactly when to turn right. And the great thing about this also, you could click a button and it would print the reverse route. Super important in the Bay Area, lots of one-way roads. You did not go back the way you came often. I loved this tool. So I would stare at this paper. If you were lucky, you could print it in color. Um, usually it was black and white. And I would follow the, that mileage just bit by bit by bit. So it was wonderful until it wasn't, until something made me deviate. Maybe I had to get gas. Maybe there was traffic or something I had to go around or kind of I would take a wrong turn. And I was so set on following these step-by-step -step directions, I actually didn't know where I was. So I would be completely lost in this, this map that I had that told me the step-by-step, -step, and it wasn't really a map, it was more of a step-by-step -step directions. 
mimicking those directions, I would get lost. Now contrast this with the Thomas Guide. I don't know if you've been around as long as I have, but the Thomas Guide was like kind of an old big map, only you didn't use your hands to like make it bigger. You actually turned the pages. So if you got lost with the Thomas Guide, you could always find your way. Yes, it would take a little longer. You probably needed to pull over, but you could find where your way was in that Thomas Guide. Now we do the same thing sometimes with mathematics. We want mathematics to be more like the Thomas Guide and less like MapQuest. We're gonna learn a little bit here and it's gonna be a little different. It's gonna look familiar at first, um, but then it's gonna change a little bit. So let's first look at this. So 12 plus two is 14. That looks, that looks pretty normal. You're kind of used to that. Um, 12 plus 13, we're gonna look at this in a different way. So I want you to learn this new way of thinking. So this 12 plus 13 is actually 30. So I want you to keep that in your mind. So 12 plus 13, you might've thought it was gonna be, it, it was gonna be um, something that you were familiar with, but no, it's gonna be 30. So remember 12 plus two is 14 and 12 plus 13, uh, 12 plus two is 14 and 12 plus 13 is 30. Okay, so 12 plus two, I want you to just kind of say in your mind, and then 12 plus 13. Okay, so excellent. So you, you have those, and I think you've got that. I think you're ready to apply now. Okay, so 13 plus two. Go ahead and add into the chat what 13 plus two is and what 13 plus 13 is. Just go ahead and add that in there. We're applying what you just learned about. What do you think that might be? Hmm, there's a lot of silence. Hmm, 15 maybe? Hmm, maybe 15? 15? Hmm, lots of good guesses. Okay, so actually it's 20 and, and 31. Oh, so we got a 15 and a 21. So that 31, so it looks like, Linda, you've got it. So let's go ahead and move on and we're gonna go ahead and do some subtraction. So now we're gonna use what we've learned and do some subtraction. So this is how some of our students feel when they're working with base 10. We understand base 10 super well. I want you to take a look at a different way of introducing 12 plus two equals 14. What do you notice and what do you wonder about this? What do you notice and what do you wonder? Hmm. Yeah, the five block is circled in that one place and that's a one over there, yeah. Yeah, why is a five represent a group of what we call 10, right? One group is five, okay, nice. So now how does it work with this? Can you see where the 30 is coming from? So 12 plus 13 equals 30. Hmm. You can see those groups of five. You see where the three is? How did, how did we get that five, you think? Yeah, yeah, so base five. So we think of base 10 as obvious, uh, but when students are learning this, sometimes they'll memorize things without actually understanding what's going on there. We're gonna play a little bit, not for too long, but we're gonna play just a little bit. So both in your resources, if you look at Polypad base five, or you can go ahead and click on that link I just put in the chat, there is a Polypad. If you've never used Polypad before, it's great virtual manipulatives. You can go ahead and click on it and then play around a little bit. See if you can see how 13 plus two equals 20 and 13 plus 13 equals 31. Um, on the polypad, you can copy things. So if you click on one of those um, five groups, you can click the little double window and it will let you copy it and you can play around with that just a little bit. And if you have an account, you can actually save it and copy it. 
So I'm going to give us just a few minutes to do that and play around with it. And if you have a new addition problem that you've discovered using that base five, you can go ahead and add it into the chat. A couple of questions you might be interested in thinking about is, is what do you think 113 would look like? Yes, the the question was, is it will the inner where the recording be available later on? And yes, it will. Oh, nice. 22 plus 20, 24 plus 22 equals 100. And what do you think it would look like? Or what about subtraction or multiplication or division? So those ideas, those conceptual 101 things, um, those ideas are all conceptual. And so um, really important to think about. So you still have the polypad, um, but if you can come back to the main screen, you can play with that polypad a little bit later. Um, what does this look like in math class? So memorizing facts. There was this article written back in 1956 um, talking about the magic number seven, plus or minus two. So the limits of our processing power are really about seven plus or minus two, maybe depending on age. Um, that's what we can keep in our head. So if we're seeing things as distinctly different, like seven plus six and eight plus five as two different facts, that takes up two of those spaces. Um, luckily, we don't have to remember phone numbers anymore, right? So uh, that idea of memorizing facts in, in school, that would take up too many things where in actuality, those are all the same thing. We can just think about maybe giving one of the sixes to the eight, and then maybe two more of the fives to the eight to make 10 plus three. And then of course, seven times eight, the most missed fact. Like if we forget what that is, which we do under stress, and we have nothing to fall back on, that memorization fails us. And instead we could kind of fall back on some of those relationships we know, like maybe seven times four and then double it. What does this look like in algebra? Memorizing steps. What's my first step in the equation? I have been guilty of saying that. So students will say, okay, so you subtract from the number on the left side from the right side, which is great until it looks like this. And then maybe it's totally different. And then what if it looks like this? Okay, well, in this case, we add. So we do the opposite. We do the opposite. But then they get something that looks like this. Do I still subtract a three from both sides? And then what if there's X's on both sides? So instead of understanding that idea of equality and what those like terms actually mean, we're trying to memorize separate things. Quadratic formula. Probably the most memorized thing in high school is that quadratic formula. So it's fine if it looks like this, right? So we know what A, B, and C are. But then as soon as you do this, why, what do I do with that 10? Is it positive? Is it negative? Can I even use, is it zero? Is C zero here? I'm not sure. And then what if it looks like this? Again, throwing that X on the other side. And then my favorite, if it's in factored form, students will distribute that just so that they can use the quadratic formula because they're falling back on that. And it's not that memorization is bad. It just doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, very young people can even remember that quadratic formula.
So we definitely don't want to think that we are teaching our students something that a three-year-old can do. We want to make sure that it's challenging enough for them to really understand the content. Of course, she can't. She's adorable, but she probably can't use the quadratic formula to solve a quadratic equation. Really liked this tweet that I saw that talks about problem solving in life versus memorization and then in school. So the majority of life is going to be problem solving, and yet the majority in school is often memorization. So how do we combat this? How do we combat this memorization issue or this mimicking issue? We need to give problem solving tasks and limit the rote tasks and build those procedures from that conceptual understanding, oftentimes with visual models. So problem solving tasks can be found all over the place. There are, these are some of my favorites. So we talked about memorizing and mimicking. Um, the next one we're gonna talk about is scaffolding too much. And we really wanna be helpful. All teachers wanna be helpful to students. And I am definitely guilty of this. So I want you to imagine your students have never tasted watermelon. So they've never tasted watermelon and you wanna bring some watermelon to class. Um, right now here in San Diego, watermelon is not really in season. So it's kind of difficult to bring watermelon. And if I did, it's like super messy, right? And hard to cut. Like you have to have one of those giant cutting boards and it's all juicy. Like they make the desks all sticky. So instead of bringing watermelon, say you wanted to give your students, you want to tell them what watermelon's like. And so you wanted to give them something that was similar to watermelon. So you make it just a little sweeter because it's not in season and you wrap it up so it's not... Um, messy, and you give them a watermelon Jolly Rancher. Now, does a watermelon candy, a watermelon Jolly Rancher, is that, like, if you tasted that, would you really know what watermelon tastes like? And we sometimes do that with math. So we take the mathematics and we wrap it up in this nice little easy to digest bundle for students, when in actuality, what we might be doing is taking away the math. So let's look at like what watermelon math might look like and what watermelon um, jelly rancher jelly rancher math might look like. So this task comes from Math for Love. This is a fraction talk. Nat Banting has a bunch of fraction talks as well. So this would be like watermelon, like nice juicy watermelon. What fractions do you see and explain how you see them? So they might not even see this whole thing as a whole. It might not be a whole of something. It might be a picture of something. And they're able to explore and take out the mathematics. Now let's contrast this with what Jolly Rancher math might look like here. So candy math. Find the total number of equal pieces. Find all those triangles and go ahead and count them. This is your denominator. How many red pieces are there? This is your numerator. Go ahead and write the fraction now by placing the red over the total, blah, 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 blah. blah. So we are telling them bit by bit, not letting them actually mathematize the problem. We're giving them that Jolly Rancher math. So let's look at another example, like um, uh, maybe an example from, this is actually from our integrated one or a algebra two one. You start with two rabbits. Each pair has four babies per month. And this is like the watermelon math. Describe that situation in as many ways as you can. Students will immediately start drawing. So they start drawing these things. Even if they've never heard of exponential equations before, they start drawing. And then like one or two groups will start making a table and you'll sort of see this flow through the room they can actually come up with the exponential equation just given this situation. So let's contrast this with what if we wanted to make this into Jolly Rancher math. So we tell them, okay, make a table and write an equation. So right away, we're telling them how to process this information. And you can bet that writing a table and an equation, they are overwhelmed with this information. And you probably actually have to draw it for them because they can't really figure out how to do a table without drawing it out. And then maybe tell them this is an exponential relationship, so we've got to use this exponential equation form. Remember, it's y equals ab to the x. And then we find a, remember how we find a? We find a by looking where x is zero. And again, we've taken the mathematics out of that whole process. We're just giving them a processed sort of watermelon. So if we do that, um, the, um, one of the unfortunate consequences is our students think math is supposed to be easy. So it's supposed to be easy for them. 
And so what happens when we do that, it, when it's not, they really struggle. Wow, I have never seen anything like this. His short game has been absolutely superb. It's, it's like he can't miss. Final, Final point for the win. The line looks, the line looks good. good. Oh, it's in. Oh, it's in. Something should be easy. <laughs> So when we do that, they think it should be really easy. And the other unintended consequence is they they think that they, they can't do anything once they get stuck. They think they need you. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No, no. no. Sorry. Sorry. Somebody! Somebody. Hello? Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. I'm gonna cry. Well, there's nothing left to do. Hey, don't, hey, worry, don't worry about, about fixing fix it in a second. He said he could fix it. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. All right. All right. That's, That's more, more like, it. like it. He says he says fix it. So yeah, I saw that you said you show that. I show that too to my students and then I'll ask them if they have a question. I'm like, are, are you on an escalator or do you really need help here? And sometimes they'll say, oh, we're on an escalator um, and they'll go on from that. Yeah, I like to show that to students. So how do we combat our Jolly Rancher math? Like how do we not scaffold too much? We need to support and really value that productive struggle and then pose those purposeful questions to get them out of unproductive struggle instead of just giving them scaffolding it step by step. So just, I want you to just think a minute how it would be different for this little girl if you told her kind of step by step how to do this. This is Clarissa and she's solving a, a task here. So we've got to realize that they get that joy when they are actually going through that productive struggle and they're able to solve it, they get that joy. Uh, so we talked about memorizing and mimicking. So the Thomas Guide, and we talked about the Jolly Rancher math. We scaffold too much. Um, this one was really tough for me. So this was masked practice. And it was probably the last of these thinking things that I really took a look at um, inside. And it's the idea of giving the same kind of problem over and over again like sort of coming up with muscle memory. So, um, and just over and over again, that same kind of problem so they could learn how to do that. So I liked this analogy from Make It Stick and it talks about, let's say you're at a campsite and you wanna go to a new place. So you get a helicopter, you fly all the way to the spot in the forest, you land the helicopter and then you explore that place. Like you learn all of the different plants, you kind of learn that whole area. Then you go back up into that helicopter and it takes you back to your campsite. So now if you had to get back to that area, unless you were paying really close attention or you had that same helicopter pilot, you wouldn't be able to make yourself back to that place where you kind of know that area. Now contrast this with hiking in. So hiking into that place and then spending some time there and hiking back out. 
and then hiking back in the next day or the next week and then hiking back out. Now, at first, it's really hard, right? Because you don't quite remember where to go and you're, you're kind of moving through these bushes. But the more traveled it is, it starts to become a path and a pathway. And the same thing happens in our brains. If we have to navigate back and forth to a concept, it becomes stronger and it becomes a pathway that we can access and use in any kind of problem solving. So that kind of analogy is really what changed my mind as far as what it looks like to do mass practice versus spaced practice. So I really liked this quote. It's one skill to hit a curveball when you know a curveball will be thrown. And it is a different skill to hit a curveball when you don't know it's coming. So if baseball players really want to optimize their skills and become better athletes, they need to spend less time practicing a curveball, hitting curveballs when they know they're coming. And most of their time practicing hitting curveballs when they don't know they're coming. So what does this look like? I mean, it just as simple as this. So instead of doing a whole page of subtraction problems, maybe mix in some addition. See how it's connected to the subtraction. So just mixing in different things and having students revisit previous concepts. So this is from my old Algebra 2 book. Of course, this chapter was all on solving quadratics, and this page was all on completing the square. So a problem over and over and over again. Now, the curriculum we use now, we use CPM, and it has these problems for their homework practice. And yes, it takes them a little longer to remember how to do them because they're not just following a procedure. They're not just letting their brain kind of check out because they already know what they're going to use to solve. So the problems take a little longer, but they're making that pathway a little bit stronger. So how do we combat the mass practice? We need to implement tasks that promote reasoning and spiral in interweave content, especially tasks that include multiple different concepts for students to go back and revisit. So we talked about memorizing and mimicking, scaffolding too much, and massed practice. The next one is how I started my teaching career was lecture. So I want you to imagine you're going to be teaching how to play baseball. So imagine how, how you're going to teach everybody how to play baseball. It's probably not going to look like this, right? Um, the baseball, here are the baseball rules. Here's how to swing a baseball bat. Here's an 11-step guide. I want you to read that and be able to do that. Mathematics is the same. Mathematics is active. We need students to be problem solving in order to be problem solvers. Um, but it's tricky. And I'll tell you why it's tricky. Let's take a look at this graph. What do you notice and what do you wonder? about this graph. You can go ahead and add that in the chat. Yeah, the blue is taller than the red, and the blue is passive learning, right? That's lecture. Actually, this is a physics class. They do prefer a lecture. They think they're learning a lot, right? So they think they're learning a whole lot there. So the passive learning is a very dynamic lecture in physics, actually. And the active learning was where students problem solved, and then the professor um, kind of brought them together and, and addressed some of their learning. So if we take a look at this, we see it is getting a higher rating. And so the tricky part is, is that we have these perceptions, this illusion of learning, when in reality, we actually are learning more from the active learning. And so this is a really important thing to share with students and parents. Um, it's the importance to ensure that neither instructors nor students are fooled into thinking that lectures are the best learning option. So students might give fabulous evaluations to an amazing lecturer when in actuality their learning isn't optimal. So that's an interesting study that sort of um, looks at that illusion of learning that we get from lecture. So we're going to do a little bit of active learning here. Um, but in order to do this, 
uh, we're going to look at two different ways to divide. And I actually didn't know about this until I talked with some of my elementary friends, but there are two different ways to sort of see division and more if you keep breaking it down. There's the quotative way. And so when we look at the total number of circles and the number of circles in each group, our answer or solution is going to be the number of groups. So how many groups? So this six divided by two means how many groups are there? So in this case, three. Um, this one, this partitive division, is we have the total number of circles and then we're given the number of groups. So this time two is our groups. And what is the number in each group? So if I take one group, how many are inside? So I get that same answer of three. And we're going to look at that in a, um, a sort of fraction idea. Okay, so in class, this is what I would be giving in class. I'd give students think time. We do a round robin where each person would share and everybody else just listens. Nobody even says anything. Um, just the one person talking. And then the debate is the round two. So we're going to go ahead and try this with our, our fraction here. So which is the best way? And none of these are the traditional algorithm. Which is the best way to solve two thirds divided by one half and then justify your choice? So you can go ahead and look at it on the screen. It's also called fraction debate in the resources, which are at the top. So if you wanted to look at those and then which is the best way to solve and then justify your choice. Mm, see. I had never seen that until I taught middle school, that idea of the common denominator. Yeah, it looks simple. As long as you understood what you were doing there, right? I like D. C. Somebody says C. Or C. Oh, that you were said C and I was talking about D. Yeah, C is very interesting. That ratio table for solving fraction division is very interesting. B, yeah, B was really interesting. It actually took me a long time to figure out how, how to do that with fractions. I didn't understand how to do for one group. That was very interesting. Okay, so while you continue to answer that, um, on A to see how many groups. Yeah, that visualization. Both both B and C. Mm, B is visual and C makes the so the ratio the ratio table. Yeah, from Pam Harris. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, we're going to take a look at my classroom solving this. This isn't the fraction problem. This is an integrated two class. So they're solving a um, a quadratic one, which is also in there. So if you want to take a look at the quadratic one, if you teach high school, um, this is my students solving. To do is each person's, each person's gonna, gonna, person's gonna, gonna take, take a turn. The person closest to this flag is going to start. They're gonna be person one. They are they going, are going to, to stay what, what their um, um, what they what think is the best. best. No one else no is going to talk. talk. They, they, they just, get, just to get to talk. And then it goes and to the, the next person. person. You do that, you do that around the whole table. table. And then when and we come back to person one, one that's, that's when you can start to argue, argue back and forth. They can change their mind and say, actually, now I think this, and this is why. And you can ask some questions and go back and forth. What questions do you have? Like how did it get the square root of it? Part of it, but then but also then method also two, method you just have to factor it and you set them as equal to zero, and there's not really a margin of error. Okay. Um, like everyone said, um, I also I think also that method four, four is the most efficient because, because it's like Desmos or a graphing calculator that has a very small margin of error. But if like on a test or something, like if you didn't have access to a graphing calculator or a computer, I would say method two is the best in this case because it's factorable and then you can use a zero product property to solve for x. Also, yes. like for the graphing one, 
since if you look at the graph, you see that negative 2, 20, and 12, 20. So those would be your x intercepts, but you may get confused because they're not the real x intercepts of the graph. But like, also, one way that graphing calculators might not be good is that, like, let's say it's like in between like a huge, two huge numbers, and then let, it's like a fifth in between. You can't really tell what number that is. But some graphing calculators, yes. especially when you, you have can, a, you can, especially when you have a radical, yes, because then you won't be able to. Yeah. Quadratic formula, it's interesting, but it's complicated, right? It's not yeah. efficient. It could be useful in some situations where you don't understand the equation to the fullest, right? But right here, it's useless. And you also so, have to, like, memorize the formula, right? <laughs> right? Okay, now I'll try and unmute myself. Sorry about that. I didn't even think about you all getting the feedback on there. Um, so that's a, a sort of occurring in the classroom. So yeah, they had some really good conversations. I loved the um, ability when they just one at a time shared and then they went back and forth. They really had a great time with that. And then we kind of combined all of those at the end and interconnected them. Like maybe you would want to see how the, how did the common denominator fit with the visual or the ratio table um, in our fraction example. And in here we looked at different ways of solving. So now that you saw that, um, how does this type of routine, so this type of debate ish routine encourage students to think mathematically more than a lecture would so what are some ways that it was it was helpful for students yeah they're involved they're invested mm -hmm. yeah they really they really own it they get quite passionate about their one they think is the best for sure Mm -hmm. Given time to think and then listening to others. Yes. Yeah, they have to understand and reason other people's ways. Yeah, yeah, they, they sound pretty confident. Yeah, they're not just told what to do. They're not told which way to solve. Yep, they have to justify and use the math terms. Yeah, so they're using the, that math vocabulary. Sometimes it's, so it's interesting. Sometimes it's an invented math vocabulary, different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, it changed their minds. Yes, yeah, for sure. Some of them did. Exposed to different thoughts and it helps them develop their thinking. Okay, thank you. So one way we can combat that thinking thief of lecture is to implement tasks that promote reasoning and problem solving. And then this one, facilitate meaningful mathematical discourse. Give them a chance to talk with each other. They can learn a whole lot from each other just by talking. So we talked about four different thinking thieves, the memorizing and mimicking, scaffolding too much, mass practice, and then the lecture first, listening for answers. And I was definitely guilty of listening for answers. And so um, let's take a look at what that might look like. So I'm going to go ahead and play a tune. And then you're going to tell me what tune I am playing in the chat. Okay, tried not to mouth the words. What was that tune? Name that tune. Or in student speak, guess what's in my head? Oh, that's pretty good. I actually had two people guess it. So very nicely done. Not jingle bells. But yes, it's row, row, row your boat. Um, that's pretty good. It's pretty, pretty, pretty good tapping. Maybe I was a little more on beat. Sometimes that happens though. We're playing a tune and, and nobody really knows what's in our head. Hickory dickory dock. Yeah, I like it. it. Like it was actually row, row your boat, but very good. Yeah. So sometimes what's in our head, our students don't understand what we are thinking and we're not taking where they are at that time. Um, this was really interesting. I saw this on Twitter and I, I, I thought about it for a long time, which is why it's in this presentation. Um, which ones are not rigid transformations? And that's where a shape moves about in a plane and doesn't change size, right? So it's not 
It's not growing or anything like that, they're just congruent. And so this student circled reflections. And so if you had just looked at this, the, that would, the, the correct answer would have been dilations. But then a conversation with this student on what they knew, they understood what each of those transformations were. They knew that a translation was just moving, so they could describe that. They knew that a dilation would grow the figure, right, in, in, in a sort of similar way. A rotation would turn it, and a reflection would flip it. And so the teacher asked, well, why did you choose reflections then? And they said, well, this is what happens. Like it comes out of the 2D plane, like it comes out of it and it flips over, like it becomes 3D and then goes back to the 2D plane. And so they had a really solid understanding. They might not have known what the word rigid transformations meant, but they knew a whole lot more than a multiple choice test would have displayed. Um, this one is, is really just a, a really bad question. Um, true or false, or maybe always true or false would be a better question, or a choice C of sometimes. But sometimes our questions are like that, like that guess what's in the teacher's um, head. Uh, I'm not going to play this, but it's in the resources. It's a five minute video. It's fantastic. So it's called Two is Greater Than Four, where listening to students is greater than listening for the right answer. So if you haven't ever listened to this, this is a great one to listen to, to really value student thinking. Um, so now I'd like to hear from you. So what is one way you like to listen to students? What is a structure you use? What is a phrase that you like to use or um, a strategy? What is one way you like to listen to students? Ah, which one doesn't belong? Yeah, that one's great. Turn and talk. Oh, ask questions with no right answer or more than one right answer. Yeah, same but different. Same but different are also good. So I'll share some of my favorites. So they're the same as yours. Ask, ask assessing questions as you circulate. Yeah, that's really good. So which one doesn't belong or sometimes is rebranded as which one is unique? Love that one. It gives everybody a chance to take a look at that uh, and choose one of them because there's a reason for all of them not to belong. Um, so you get, really get to hear like all of the vocabulary, all of the student thinking. Uh, what do you notice? What do you wonder? So this is a great way to get everything that students understand before you start your lesson. So what do you notice, what do you wonder is a really great way to hear what students are thinking and to encourage curiosity. Same but different. So really to see what students' conceptions are. This one is from Sue Looney. Um, this is a, a great um, task to really hear like what, what are those nuances between the two. Um, Chris Luzniak has debate math, another really great way to listen to student thinking. And you can just circulate around the room and hear really what students are thinking about. Yeah, listening to students. I agree, that notice and wonder. Um, always, sometimes, never. Uh, they like a little bit of controversy, yes. Tell me all you can. Yeah, that one's fantastic too. And then um, tell me some more. Um, can you tell me more about that? And just to continue to press on their thinking. So the way we combat not listening to students, um, it's really hard, first of all. We've got a lot of things going on. But we want to elicit and use evidence of student thinking and then pose those purposeful questions. So those questions to really get at what students are thinking, not to get at the right answer. So the next one we want to talk about is one way of doing things. So just having one way that you think is the best way to do that it gets students stuck kind of in the same way as the path. So we want to give students multiple ways to access problems and especially visually. So visual is super, super important as far as that spatial reasoning and mathematical ability. They are intricately connected. So we want to really value that spatial thinking and that idea of visualizing things. So this is some student work. They were just working on the distributive property. And this, this student got this problem marked wrong um, because they didn't use what they were working on. Now, whether the student knows, OK, I was supposed to use a distributive property, but I could solve it like this, we don't really know, right? Um, but they chose to solve it in a different way. So they, and instead, they got this little mark on their paper. 
thinking that, that maybe they might not be a mathematician unless they have high um, agency and they think, oh, well, this teacher just didn't know what they were doing. So that can happen too. But it just depends on what, what that student feels about mathematics and themselves as a mathematician. Okay, yeah, I would prefer that method too. I, I really like that. So we're going to play again a little bit. Um, we're going to play with this polypad activity. If you look on your resources, um, it is linked, but I will also put it in the chat. I want you to take a look at this and see how you see it growing. So how does it go from figure one to figure two? Like, how does it do that? And you can go ahead and mark it on the figure if you want to. You can type it in the chat if you want to. Um, but then the, there's the polypad for you to play with. If you have a Polypad account, you can actually save it and put it in the chat for other people to see. And we're just going to take a few minutes to take a look at that. And on the Polypad, there's a little pen that you can draw if you want to at the bottom. Mm, the C, the C method. How do you save it? If you have to have a Polypad account. So if you have a, oh, you have an account, you click up at the top right where you click save. And then you click this little, so on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. And then it says sharing. And then you just click that little sharing button and use a link. Did that work? So Melissa said she saw it as a C, and that's pretty common. Like a lot of students will see that as a C. So that idea of adding a C each time. So in, in figure one, we don't see a C, um, but in figure two, we see that C of five. And then in figure three, we see two Cs of five, and then three Cs of five in figure four. So we're adding that C of five every time. Yeah, you see the added five each time? So the added five, did you see it as a C? I, I didn't see it as a C as for, at first either, but I think that's really interesting clumping that up. So that, that whole idea that there are, is one less C than the figure number, and then we always have that three. So that's one way of seeing it. There are lots of different ways to see this. Another way might be, I don't know if you saw the lines, like the vertical lines. Some, some see those horizontal lines and some see vertical lines. So this is a, a vertical line one. Um, so if we look at that figure one, we can see three. That was you. Yeah. So we see the three. And then in figure two, we see two, two reds or two threes in this case. Figure three, we see three reds. And then um, figure two, we have one yellow. So we've got the twos. And then in figure three, we have two yellows. Oh, thanks. You shared your polypad. That's great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we can see the yellows here. And then um, other ways to see it, some, some might see it horizontal and some might even see it, anybody see it as double squares and then subtract the middle. So that's another way of seeing it. 
Yeah, double and two more, double and two more. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, so you doubled it and then added two more. All right, all right, thank you all. So how do we empower students to think that way um, and to think in more than one way is really to value it, to really think that that's interesting. So use and connect mathematical representations that's in between, but also elicit and use evidence of student thinking in more than one way and especially visual, especially visual. So the other thing is, is unaware of previous learning. So I've been lucky enough to partner with um, an elementary math TOSA, and we saw a lot of similarities. Um, and it was something I never thought about as a middle and high school teacher. I never thought about what was happening in elementary school. Um, so being unaware of previous learning can really impact how we teach things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the area model. So we start in TK and in K with this idea of five and 10 frames, so groups of. So that's just when they're starting to see groups. Then we move on in first and second grade to repeated addition. And notice we still see those kinds of groups of things. So and in a sort of area way. In third grade, we go to this idea of finding areas of shapes and using that for multiplication. In fourth grade, we do double digit multiplication. And that's really tough. So we pull back out those base 10 blocks to see what that really means when we multiply. What do those areas actually look like before we start representing it with a model? Now, take a look at this model. You're going to see this model as they go through high school, and it's going to look a lot like this. This idea of partial products, taking those areas. When I first saw this, I said, hey, that's an integrated one. So let's keep taking a look there. This is our middle school math textbook. This is Connected Math, and we see those ideas of areas. Now, notice we have X's here. So like the traditional algorithm, it's not going to work with these X's right here, right? We're not, there's nothing to carry a one here. So that's going to be a little bit tricky if we try to fall back on what we knew before if we didn't have that understanding of the area model. And this comes from our integrated one textbook. We're actually multiplying binomials by finding those partial products and then adding them together. So that's directly connected to what we saw in fourth grade. In, in integrated two, or um, maybe algebra two, if you have the traditional curriculum, completing the square, we pull back out those algebra tiles. That's super hard for students to visualize, but you're actually completing a square. And we use that area model to make that understanding. Even in integrated three, we divide polynomials by using what we know about the area model. And then MIT put out a really cool model about taking the derivative of the product and how that can be connected with that area model. So it goes all the way through from TK until beyond our high school mathematics curriculum. So how do we combat that? We have to build that procedural fluency from conceptual understanding. That's why we pulled back out those algebra tiles and those base 10 um, blocks and use and connect those mathematical representations throughout the grade level. It's really important to know where students are coming from and where they're going to. Now, this is appropriate for the last one because we have six minutes left. Um, limited processing time. So we want to be really careful about that. Don't worry, this one is quick and I promise I'll give you a little bit of processing time at the end. The Thinking Thief 8 is limited processing time. Trying to get through all the problems. Answering our own questions. If people don't answer our questions, I have been totally guilty of that. Um, calling on the two or three raised hands and thinking all of our students understand. Um, not coming back to previous concepts. That mixes in with that mixed space practice versus the masked practice. So I thought this was interesting. This is from the Tim study quite a while ago. If you look at the United States, you can see that we taught 82% of the material, but only students only scored 58% right there. Um, Singapore did better. Uh, they also have a lot more days of school than we do. But then if you take a look at Japan, they only taught 54% of the content, yet they got about 70% correct, um, which is very interesting. So if we teach for depth, students are able to uncover and problem solve problems they might not have even seen before. So how do we combat the thinking thief of limited processing time? Uh, establish mathematics goals to focus the learning and really concentrate on those, uh, those goals. And then in order to do that, also facilitate that meaningful discourse. That's how students are going to be able to process and keep that learning. 
So here are eight thinking thieves. And interestingly, they are tied directly to our eight effective mathematics teaching practices. So in order to combat them, this is like my lifelong goal is to get to these effective practices. Um, and I still strive every year to get a little bit closer. But we have these eight effective teaching practices from principles to action that help guide us on how to become more effective teachers. So our session goal was to examine eight ways we unintentionally limit student thinking and what we can do instead. Um, the resources are there for you. And then if you would like to contact me, um, here is my email, it's at the, at the bottom. And then my Twitter handle is at Tracy Teacher. And if you could just share one idea you might like to try um, in the chat for the next month. And I also have three minutes for questions. Thank you, Tracy, very much. Um, we'll watch the chat for questions. Um, please ask her anything and share what she wanted you to share for the next month. I just wanted to let you all know before you um, start shutting off for the evening that our next presentation will be on April 5th. It's called Reigniting Our Passion, 10 Tips to Thrive Post-Pandemic and Are We Are are we there yet with Sean Nank? Um, the recording of this one will be available right after we end, or you will get an email probably in the morning that will have the link also. So shout out your questions. I like that curveball analogy too. That was awesome, Tracy. Yeah, that slide was powerful for me too, looking at it. Oh, yeah, teaching integers. Mm -hmm. Teaching integers is a struggle in more than one way is really good for that with those zero pairs and number lines and counters and all kinds of great things. Thank you all for your participation and your engagement. It's a great way to spend an evening. It always gets you remotivated for tomorrow. <laughs> All right. With that, I would like to thank Tracy again for sharing with us tonight. We hope we enjoy. I hope all of you enjoyed the session and look forward to seeing you guys on April 5th. Good night, everyone. We'll hang around for another minute or two, but then I will stop the recording. So good night. Or good morning for some of them, probably, right, Tracy? <laughs>
an elevator, you probably do need help. So. <laughs> it's great all to right. fall back on for sure. It is. It brings a little humor into the day when they're trying to work so hard. Mm -hmm. All right. I think everybody's pretty much just said that. So I'm going to stop the recording.